Wouldn't it be amazing to have an AI agent working alongside you in Jupyter Notebooks, assisting you by automatically and fluently reasoning about data? Welcome to episode number 938 of the Super Data Science Podcast. I'm your host, John Crone. Today's guest is Rohan Kodialam, co-founder and CEO of Sphinx, a startup that has raised $9.5 million in venture capital to finally bring to data science and data analysis the same kind of agentic capabilities we've come to expect from LLMs with natural language and code. Rohan is an outstanding speaker building a revolutionary AI product. I'm confident you'll enjoy this one. Rohan, welcome to the Super Data Science Podcast. It's great to have you here. We are recording live in person at the beautiful Bessemer Venture Partners office in New York. People watching the video version can see the New York Public Library in Bryant Park at sunset. It is a beautiful thing to see. Rohan, you spent years leading data science at prominent institutions like Citadel. What's the problem you noticed in data science that you're solving with your new startup, Sphinx. Yeah, absolutely. So thanks for having me, first of all. Um, really, like in my time working on data, I think the most evident problem we found was that data and software engineering are often confused. Um, they seem similar at first glance because they're both just like writing code to the layperson. Uh, but it's almost like the difference between like writing a poem and writing like you know a, a, a technical paper. Like they're both English. They're very different from each other. Um, when working on data, I think the intuition that one needs to build is actually on the data itself. It's not necessarily on like a code base or on any kind of like uh, well-documented knowledge, but rather on whatever information is encapsulated within the structure of that data. And that's really what Sphinx is solving. We're trying to build an AI layer that can understand data at the same level of intuition as, say, a quant or a data scientist, and then deploy that understanding of data, um, that treatment of data as its own modality. Uh, as a tool for AI models to then be able to agentically do data science work, to do quantitative research work, uh, to basically help people go from raw information to insights very quickly without making the kind of mistakes that we see, say, the Claude codes of the world doing when they're taken out of their you know, natural regime of doing software engineering and just kind of slapped onto data kind of ad hoc. Right. So is it is it in these kinds of agentic processes applied to data science where you see a lot of failures, uh, or like, where are you seeing failures mm -hmm. in AI being applied to data science, and how does Sphinx mitigate those failures? Yeah, absolutely. So, like, I, I'll start with a very simple example. Like, if you imagine a linear regression, which I think is like kind of the most basic thing one can do in data science, if your data is clean and you ask any AI model you want to make a linear regression, it will probably work. Um, if you imagine even like the slightest deviation from the ideal state, you have some outliers. Some of the data is invalid it's not actually linear and it's kind of like a different uh, kind of shape uh, and you toss even like a frontier coding agent at it, you tend to get like very variable answers. Like sometimes it's right, often it's wrong, often it just kind of does some action. Uh, and what you'll find is that these models uh, and AI in general are thinking about uh, this is a coding problem. So the task is write some code, you write the code, the code runs successfully and produces an R squared or correlation or whatever it is. And mission accomplished, right? The failure I'm seeing here is that you're not actually interpreting the data at all, right? You're never looking at the data, trying to understand the data. And this is just like a mode of thinking that doesn't work. Uh, human data scientists wouldn't act that way. I mean, or they wouldn't get very far if they acted that way. And we want to kind of bridge that gap with Sphinx's technology. Nice. I like that. And so I understand as part of this, there was, you know, training of, or, or yeah, like, is there training of of bespoke models, or is it about is it about getting the context right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, like right off the bat, like we operate on data as a modality. That's our bread and butter. We don't want to compete with certain large players on text as a modality or images as a modality. Right? They're very good at that, and we want to be able to leverage their advances as part of our product. Uh, so we only build a representation learning layer for, for data. So how do you turn data into context? And then if it's something else that's outside of data, we will rely on frontier models, right? Um, I will make this visible, visual for you. I don't know if the camera can see it, but certainly people can here, here can see it, right? So this, this is, uh, I think, Walmart stock price, right, over the last five years. I have it on like 80 pages of just like junk, right? And this is how your LLM is going to interpret data today. It's just going to see a bunch of numbers. It's going to read these numbers as text and hope to make some sense of it, right? Now, you as a human can probably say, OK, I'm not going to do that. I'm instead going to use a candlestick chart, right? I'm going to look at something like this. And by looking at this, instead of the stack of paper, you can immediately see this thing went up, it came down, you understand the trend, you understand the variation, you understand a whole bunch of information just by seeing this, right? Um, this is what we're trying to do for AI. So you have data. 
you can encode it as text. Uh, that's what models do now. And then once you do that, you get barely any intuition from it. On the flip side, as a human, you can encode it with a variety of structures. Like, you know, there's a whole slew of ways to visualize quantitative information. And then you as a human look at that, and you in your mind can then do inference to understand that information. AI doesn't work the exact same way. It's not great at interpreting things like, say, a scatter plot or a chart. It usually gets some very mixed signals from it. Um, if you want to try, go make a scatter plot, put it into ChatGPT, and say, what is the um, correlation of these points? And you'll get like something kind of vague, usually. Uh, but what we're finding is that our technology can actually help you contextualize data in a way that AI can understand. And then with that context, combined with other people's innovations in terms of understanding code, understanding natural language, we're able to do data science much more effectively than uh, you know, just an out-of-the-box software agent. Nice, I love that. And so the analogy, just to kind of repeat it, and also maybe go into a tiny bit more detail for people listening in an audio-only format to a <laughs> podcast or even watching it at home, there's a, so, and this makes, this analogy is so perfect, Rohan, because it's so easy for me to understand, even describe uh, in audio, because yeah, Amazon share price, if you represent it as text, it's just 80 pages where, so it's kind of, it's the, it's the closing price and the opening price on a bunch of days over a five year <laughs> period, and it creates an 80 page stack of text. And you can just imagine how easily that would fail as data to be interpreted by a model, whereas th those same data represented on a candlestick chart, on a on a on a plot, on exactly. like a, <laughs> exactly on a on a line plot, basically for people who don't know the finance uh, kind of candlestick look, and it's it's just it's obvious you can you know it's so much easier to understand, and so that makes a lot of sense. I can see why there's such an opportunity for you at Sphinx. So we kind of understand the value of what you're doing. What is the experience like for users? So mm -hmm. if I'm a data scientist or I'm an AI engineer or a data analyst, yep. and I'm thinking, wow, this sounds great. I wish I had an LLM or I wish I had a product like Sphinx that, could be, that I could be using data with just like I can use natural language with one of the Frontier Labs. Mm -hmm. um, what's that experience like for users in Sphinx? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So like we think... Uh, this like Andrew Ang said this too, right? Like you want your LLMs or your agents to be able to have very varied levels of agenticity. Uh, so we adopt that philosophy. So for a user of Sphinx, you can go from I don't want to make this plot or I don't want to interpret this data, just do this one thing for me, all the way up to much more agentic flows. Like here is a problem, here is my data warehouse, go solve it, right? Uh, we offer people that full range of experiences and we also believe that AI models should fundamentally be highly configurable in natural language. So as a user, when you onboard to Sphinx, we can onboard you in like five minutes and then you're, you're on the product, you can really tell it to do whatever you want. Most of our users start small. They'll be, say, in a Jupyter notebook and they'll come across two annoying tables that they don't want to join. They'll say, okay, Sphinx, can you join them for me? And Sphinx will figure out how I understand it. And so, when you, when you, so when you're in the Jupyter notebook exactly. and you say that, well, how, are you, how are you doing mm -hmm. it? You, you type it as a command? You just type it in, right? It's a very, very familiar interface to anyone who's used any AI coding tools. You type it in as a command. Uh, and then that command gets contextualized. We figure out what data we need to answer it, whether it's already in your kernel, whether it's in your data warehouse, like wherever it is, we'll go find it, get it, put it through our representation learning ma machinery. Once we understand the data, it's usually relatively obvious to say, oh, okay, like you have these two columns that probably mesh together. Here's how we transform them. Here's what's missing. Here's what I got to impute. It'll do that for you. And it all runs on your side, right? So um, the, the other aspect for, for data is like, most people think of data as, as a crown jewel of their company or even of their own personal work, right? So we don't want to take anyone's data. Uh, we actively don't do that. So the way Sphinx runs is it figures out what to do and it runs it on your computer or your server or your, your kind of compute environment. So once Sphinx figures out what to do, it executes on your side, you have a result in your environment with code you can run uh, and then you can proceed from there. That's how people start. Once you see it work a few times and you're like, oh, it actually does work. Uh, and, and people need to do that because you've tried using you know, cursor or Claude code to do it and, it and it doesn't, so you don't really believe me at first, but then it works three times, four times, and you're like, oh, maybe I can just help do the whole thing. And then you start to graduate to like much more agentic flows. And that's really like nice. our happy path for users. I like that. And so you mentioned Jupyter Notebooks there. Mm -hmm. And so does Sphinx operate inside of a Jupyter Notebook or it feels like a Jupyter Notebook? Yeah, yeah. Um, this is a great question. So there are two relationships we have with the Jupyter Notebook or like the kind of interactive computing more broadly. Uh, the first more obvious one is that we use that as our choice of front end. Um, data scientists are super familiar with it. It's kind of like the de facto standard. Um, and so when we want to expose a way for a human to inspect Sphinx's work, 
to change things' work, to put in their own code if they decide this is, you know, I'm just going to do this myself manually because I have some strong bias and how it's supposed to be done. Uh, the Jupyter Notebook is the right format to capture that uh, in a way that's familiar but also quite powerful. The second uh, deeper way is that I think a lot of coding agents today kind of think of the uh, like the bash terminal as their as their like home base, right? They're running commands. If you want to read something, you ls the directory and you go cat the file. We actually use the Python kernel as our kind of home base for our agent. Uh, the reason for that is we're manipulating data so much that we want something as representative as Python to be able to take objects that live in memory ephemerally and transform them into something that our models can use. So because we're operating on the IPython kernel as kind of our fundamental building block of agentic steps, it's actually incredibly easy for us to expose Jupyter as the interface. So it's like a you know, happy coincidence. So we can give people an interface they're familiar with that works like almost anywhere with any type of compute, with any type of data, but also naturally meshes with how the agent is thinking about the problem internally. I love it. And then so then when I'm in a Jupyter Notebook, I'm used to kind of having a markdown cell or a code mm -hmm. cell. So is there like a third type of cell that's like a Sphinx cell or? We, we operate in markdown cells and code cells, right? So we don't want to like um, build something that you're not familiar with, right? Like at the end of the day, we do this inference, we figure out the right way to do it, but the way it's implemented has to run on your system. Uh, we want it to be portable, we want it to be understandable, auditable, like uh, even, if, even if you trust us, you should always have the ability to go audit what we've done. Yeah. Uh, so we operate in, in code cells, right? Uh, SQL, Python, um, uh, Markdown, so, right? So you're in the code cell and then you just start writing in natural language. Yeah, uh, we, we uh, um, not exactly. From the interface perspective, we want to kind of have Sphinx as like a separate chat. So think of it almost more like Claude Code, uh, uh, where see. you can ask Sphinx to take actions. Uh, the level of abstraction at which Sphinx operates is like more at the action level than like, um, you know, we're going to write one line of code for you. Uh, because at the end of the day, data science, the code is just a means to an end. Right? I see, I you see. want to accomplish something with your data, you tell us what you want to accomplish, and we'll go help you do it. So it's kind of, it's alongside me there as I code or... Exactly. I see. Yeah, that's I see. right. I see. Perfect. Now I understand. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. All right. So you only founded the company this year, but mm -hmm. I understand you've already been making some impact for clients. Yes. Uh, I also understand that those clients must remain anonymous, <laughs> but you know, using some anonymity, uh, some obfuscation, mm -hmm. I'd love to hear just you know one or two use cases of, of how Sphinx has already made an impact for your clients. Yeah. Okay. So uh, most of our uh, users already, uh, given the, the you know how young the company is, are people who already value data a lot. So these are people, as you can imagine, who have data teams, invest a lot in their data teams, and want their data teams to be successful. Honestly, it's not that exciting. Like, it's not that revolutionary what we're doing there. We're taking something they want, we're making them five times faster at it, and they're happy. Cool. Um, what I think is more interesting and where I see the kind of future trajectory of the company going long term is in spaces where it's not like you have a huge data team and you're just starting to think about data as a concept. Uh, and so when you do something like that, uh, we, have, we have, for example, one of our early customers is in the CPG space. Um, and you see actually very transformative effects where they actually are now seeing, hey, like, we should hire more data scientists because each individual data scientist can do so much more work, right? Uh, and they have transformed part of our businesses and they're actually adding value. And so uh, that's really what we want to see. We want to see data science becoming part of the DNA of every institution. And the, you know, the more value we're adding is in cases where it's not already the case and they realize we're sitting on a pile of information, we can monetize it, right? And, and so that, that's been quite transformative for us, seeing how the actual dynamics of the data team change where, um, some people obviously are like, oh, like, do you need data scientists? And we're like, of course you need data scientists, right? Because they're the ones who are asking the right questions. Uh, and in fact, each data scientist can do so much more, and that profession just becomes more valuable with the right toolkit. Right, so this is a, a common concern that people have yeah. over AI, yes. is that it replaces people in roles. And of course, some specific functions in roles end up being yes. replaced. So you know, there's very little reason today to be typing out every character of code Exactly. that you write <laughs> or yes. that you use. Yeah. Um, and so then somebody might think, oh, well then maybe we only need 10 data scientists instead of 30 because they don't need to be doing all the coding. But you make a really great point there, which is it's actually, this is what we've seen with every automation over the past 200 years, exactly. yep. is that it actually creates more jobs because it allows people to be, a, to be creating so much more value. You're sitting mm -hmm. on top of more abstractions. You're able to work, work more rapidly and each data scientist that that CPG company hires exactly. is now providing more ROI as opposed to being, you know, caught up in data ops or ML ops, mm -hmm. uh, you know, struggling with some simple low-level coding. 
Yeah, that's that's absolutely right. Like, and and we see this as like data as a super unsaturated space. Um, there are so many companies which have a lot of data are not monetizing at all. You see these like Harvard Business School statistics of like 80% of CEOs say data is a top priority. 20% of CEOs actually invest in data. Okay, like there's clearly some problem here. Maybe it's too expensive. Maybe it's too complicated. Like, uh, right? But Sphinx lowers all those barriers and lets data teams actually deliver to their full potential. Right? And that's why we see for some of our early customers, their data teams have doubled. Right? And that that's great. So amazing to see that. Very cool. Nice uh, sound bites in yeah. there as well. <laughs> Um, all right, so Sphinx obviously sounds like a fantastic product. How can people here sitting at Bessemer Venture mm-hmm. Partners in real life or our listeners at home, how can they access Sphinx and is there a free tier? Yes, so there absolutely is a free tier. Um, so our, our website is sphinx.ai. Um, you can get our free tier there. It's a giant button on the top. Sphinx runs on basically whatever compute you want. It runs on whatever database you want. If you don't have data, it will run on CSVs and things like that too. If you're going to use it at home on your on like a pet project, uh, we sit on top of uh, of Jupiter as our interface, so that like it's quite familiar to anyone who works with data to just jump in and start working. And really, like again, we believe deeply that Sphinx should be configured in natural language. So that means you don't need to do any setup, you don't need to do any integrations. You just download the thing, sign up for an account, off you go. Our free tier is like pretty generous. You can generally do you you can do like almost whatever you want. You can do like it's probably 10 or 20 analyses before it runs out. And then um, if you are doing something sufficiently interesting with your free tier, please just reach out to me. We'll just give you more credits. Like we, we're much more interested in seeing people do cool things than in like, you know, nickel and diming anyone. Nice. That sounds great, Rohan. Uh, thank you for offering that. Uh, so that is really the end of my technical questions mm-hmm. for you. But as regular listeners of this podcast will know, not necessarily everyone here at uh, Bessemer today, but um, I always ask my guests for a book recommendation. What do you have for us, Rohan? Okay, so I'm going to give you a book that is very related to Sphinx. Maybe not so fun, but I obviously spend most of my time working on Sphinx. There's a book called, uh, and I'm sure someone's recommended this before on your podcast. It's called The Visual Display of Quantitative Information. Tough. Uh, yes, that's the one. Um, I like that book a lot because it kind of goes through the history of how humans in their minds built the equivalent of Sphinx. Everything from like the famous graph of like Napoleon's army in Russia dwindling down to almost no one, uh, to like you know John Snow's plot of cholera in London. Which, by the way, I, if you read our blog, you'll find that AI cannot replicate that analysis. So another example of how it's bad at data science. But regardless of that, um, there's just this whole history of like hundreds of years of humans trying to figure out data is big, data is complicated. How do we stuff it into our heads? It's kind of inspirational to see how people have done that and like the kind of work that's come out of it. Whether it's you know, analytical or like public health outcomes or like, uh, you know, other kinds of outcomes that are beneficial to the community. And so uh, it's a super interesting book, definitely like explains what Sphinx is, but also it's just a fun read and it has a lot of pretty pictures. So it's like a easy reading if you're also coding, you know, 18 hours a day, so. Fantastic. Thanks, Rohan. So yes, Sphinx.ai for Sphinx. And then for following you, for getting some more of your insights, where should people follow you? Yeah, so I, I'm on X, um, Cody Alam Rowe on X. Uh, I'm also on LinkedIn, of course. Um, most of my content is AI data science related, as you might imagine. Uh, so if you're interested in that, definitely uh, take a look. Uh, Sphinx posts reasonably interesting blog posts pretty often. So would love to have you read them. And um, yeah, we're, we're always looking for comments from the data community. We, uh, we build this for the data community. We're from the data community. Like most of our team have experience working in data science or in quantitative research. So we, we'd love to hear from you, especially criticisms. That's much more interesting and useful for our team than uh, anything else. Yeah. Nice, thank you. What an exceptional episode with Rohan Cody alum, who's revolutionizing and accelerating data science with Sphinx AI. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. To be sure not to miss any of our exciting upcoming episodes, subscribe to this podcast if you haven't already. But most importantly, I just hope you'll keep on listening. Until next time, keep on rocking it out there. And I'm looking forward to enjoying another round of the Super Data Science Podcast with you very soon. Mm-hmm.